The Lord be with you and welcome to online worship at First United Methodist Church in Hanover, Pennsylvania. I'm Pastor Greg, senior pastor here at First United Methodist Church, and this is the second weekend of a 40-day journey known as Lent. As we shared last week, Lent is a time in which we focus a little bit more intently on our faith, in our mistakes, in our sins, in our relationship with God. We ask and answer the question, how satisfied are you with your life, love relationship with God? And even more importantly, how satisfied do you think God is? There's always something more to learn. There's always a little bit more to grow. God is ready to stretch us in new directions. Let it happen during this next day, during this 40-day period of Lent. Uh, today we're looking at prayer, and, and we have a way of making prayer seem very, very difficult, as if it's something that only the extra skilled people can do. But that's not true. Everybody who feels, who thinks, and can speak can pray. So in a few moments when we get to the prophet Jeremiah, we're going to show you that prayer is a whole lot easier than you ever thought. So you've come to the right place to take a next step closer to God. So as worship begins, let's sing. see the world the way you do let's take our time open our eyes look and listen we're gonna find we're more like than we are different why does kindness seem revolutionary when did we let hate get so ordinary let's turn it around flip the script judge slow love quick god help us get revolutionary whoa revolutionary whoa let's get let's get whoa revolutionary whoa what would jesus do he would love first he would love first he would love first what would jesus do he would love first he would love first so we should love first let's take our time open our eyes look and listen but we're gonna find we're more like than we are different Does kindness seem revolutionary? When did we let hate get so ordinary? Let's turn it around, flip the script, judge slow, love quick. God help us get revolutionary. Whoa, revolutionary. Whoa, let's get, let's get. Whoa, revolutionary. God help us get revolutionary.
Jeremiah is often referred to as the weeping prophet because he experienced heartache and, and struggle, the likes of which very few servants of God have ever endured. His job from God was to warn the people of Jerusalem to repent and return to God before God would allow the armies of Babylon to tear down the city gates and to destroy Jerusalem as a punishment. He knew it was coming, but nobody would listen to him. No one would listen to the warning. Not only that, the more passionately Jeremiah tried to plead with the people to return to God, the more that they would abuse him, beat him, imprison him, torture him, humiliate him. So not only was he frustrated in his work, but he was feeling pretty sorry for himself. And what you're about to hear in Jeremiah 20, verses 7 through 18, really is a prayer. But it's an odd-sounding prayer. It's an ugly-sounding prayer. Who says that prayer always has to sound pretty? All prayer needs to be is honest. So hear the honesty from the depths of Jeremiah's soul. O oh Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You were stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out. I shout violence and destruction. The word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision all day long. If I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in God's name. There is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, for I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is on every side. Denounce him, let us denounce him, say all my close friends, watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived. Then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, who tests the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them. For to you have I committed my cause." Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of evildoers. But cursed be the day on which I was born, the day when my mother bore me. Let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father, a son is born to you, making him very glad. Let that man be like the cities that the Lord overthrew without pity. Let him hear a cry in the morning and an alarm at noon, because he did not kill me in the womb. So my mother would have been my grave, and her womb forever great. Why did I come out of the womb to see toil and sorrow, and spend my days in shame? Some of you may remember the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, where George Bailey was so frustrated with his life, he makes a wish before the angel, and his wish was, I wish I'd never been born. Well, that's what Jeremiah has just said to the, to the Lord God. I wish I'd never been born. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of my favorite movies of all time is M. Night Shyamalan's movie, Signs, starring Mel Gibson. How many have seen it? Raise your hand. It is the perfect movie to ease into this, at times, painful conversation about prayer. Because Signs is a movie about prayer. It's a movie about our personal relationship with God and how the tragedies of life can damage that relationship. Now, if you've ever seen the movie, you may be a little surprised to hear me say that because you thought it was about aliens from another planet attacking the Earth. Well, you're not wrong. I mean, there are aliens. There is an invasion and an attack. But long before any of that, it is about a husband who has lost his wife. She was hit by a car and killed in a freak accident walking along the road one night. Reverend Graham Hess, played by Mel Gibson, like any one of us would be, was crushed by her death. But he blamed God for it. He blamed God for not stopping it. After all, 
He and his family had already given up so much to serve God. God should have done more to protect them. He was angry at God. Angry is too small of a word. He was furious at God. So furious, in fact, he gave up on God completely. He quit his job as a pastor. He quit the church that he was serving. And most importantly, he quit praying. I will not waste one more minute on prayer, he said. And as the movie unfolds, the unthinkable happens and the aliens invade. They board up the farmhouse and they have one last meal together before the attack begins. And everybody in the family has their favorite food and the table is piled high. And everyone is seated around the table ready to eat when Graham's son asks, shouldn't we pray first? And through clenched teeth, his father coldly replies, I will not waste one more minute on prayer. I told you he meant it. And then the attack comes. The house is overwhelmed and the family is driven down into the basement, desperately pushing on the basement door with all their might, straining to keep the alien attackers out. And during the struggle, Graham's young son suffers a massive asthma attack and he cannot breathe. The medicine is upstairs in the kitchen and it's beyond their reach. And in that moment, knowing he can't reach the medicine and his son can't breathe, it's just too much. You know, everyone has their breaking point. This was Graham's breaking point. He holds his dying son in his arms and he looks upwards and he says, I hate you. And he says it over and over again. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. You know, at first I thought he was talking to the aliens, scratching and clawing their way in. But then it becomes clear that he's actually talking to God. It's uncomfortable for us to hear someone tell God with such intensity that they hate him. But there are two very important things for us to remember. It may be painful to hear, but it is absolutely honest. Second, even though it is a vicious thing to say, for the first time in a long time, Graham is actually talking to God. These lessons from such a strange story help explain this equally uncomfortable chapter from the prophet Jeremiah. Young Jeremiah became a prophet in a time when it also felt like the world was coming to an end. Invaders were coming from far away, not from another planet, but from the empire of Babylon, and they would attack. They would overwhelm the villages and the cities of Israel, breaking down the city gates, forcing their way into the houses and the homes, killing everyone that they found. It was Jeremiah's job to get the people ready for this invasion. God was more than willing to protect them, to miraculously beat back the invading hordes. But there was a problem standing in the way. The people had stopped talking to God. They had turned their back on God. They had clearly told God that they didn't want him in their lives. God, take your rules and take your commandments and take your expectations and leave us alone. Fine. God doesn't force himself on anyone. But when we turn God down, we are also saying no thank you to all of God's blessings as well. Jeremiah was sent by God to call the people to come on back to God. Warn them, Jeremiah, of the disaster that is coming and urge the people to come back to me so I can rescue them. You would think that Jeremiah would be warmly embraced for doing this, but he wasn't. In Jeremiah 11, we're told that the people of his hometown were so infuriated by the prophet and his message that they plotted against him, scheming about how they might kill him. Jeremiah became a laughingstock. He was openly mocked and made fun of. He had run-ins with the false prophets who told him that he was wrong. And when he prophesied that Judah would be handed over to Babylon, a priest named Pasher tried to convince King Zedekiah to put Jeremiah to death. Like I said, everyone has their breaking point. This was Jeremiah's. He felt alone and abandoned by his people. He felt alone and abandoned by God. Every time he opened his mouth, doing the work that God had called him to do, things only seemed to get worse. 
Is it any wonder that Jeremiah would reach a point where he began to question everything? Is it any wonder that he would clearly state that he never wanted this call to begin with? This was God's idea, not Jeremiah's. Is it any surprise that he would accuse God of deceiving him, of seducing him, of setting him up to fail? He calls God a liar. Can you believe that? He calls God a con man, a bully. He doesn't hold anything back. He lets it all out. He lets God have it. And I don't know about you, but I'd be afraid of lightning bolts coming down out of the sky any second now. But they don't, do they? Do you know why? Because Jeremiah was not really attacking God. He wasn't really insulting God, even though the things he said sound insulting. He was not rejecting God. He was, believe it or not, praying. I have said this many times in many different ways in many different Sundays here at First Hanover. At its heart, prayer is simply being completely honest and open with God, period. Prayer is not magic words. Prayer is not learning how to butter God up to get him to give us what we want. Prayer is climbing up on God's lap and telling him whatever is on our mind. Whatever we are feeling, whatever we need, whatever scares us, whatever has us at the breaking point. God knows everything that we've done. God knows everything that we're thinking. So it's not like God is in the dark until we open up. It's just that God wants to be a part of what we're thinking. God wants to be let in to what we're feeling. God wants to be a part of the things that we need. And that's what relationships are all about, aren't they? Sharing life together. That includes the good days as well as the bad days. That includes the ugly thoughts as well as the noble ones. Jeremiah's prayer doesn't begin with adoration or confession or thanksgiving or supplication. What Jeremiah has to say isn't poetic or flowery. And at the beginning at least, it's not even all that flattering. Instead, Jeremiah gets real honest really quick. There's no pretending, there's no posturing, there's no pandering. Just blunt, cards on the table honesty. Honest emotion. Oh Lord, you have deceived me. Raw, unbridled anguish. I have become a laughing stock every day and everyone mocks me. It's true. The prophet Jeremiah's prayer begins with a hopeless situation that he finds himself in. His prayer, in other words, begins in a place of honesty. A place of humility in which he expresses his helplessness and his need before God. He doesn't pretend that things are better than they really are. He doesn't put on a happy face and pretends that everything is okay. Because it's not. Life sucks. And he's honest with God about how much life sucks. And if you're struggling saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe the pastor just used the word suck. I'm being honest about the way we are. Honest about the way we feel. This is the first thing we learn about prayer from Jeremiah. Say it like it is. The Norwegian theologian Ole Hallesby put it this way. We only need two things to truly pray. Helplessness and faith. If we aren't helpless, then we can figure things out on our own and we don't need God. We go to God with the stuff that is beyond us. We go to God with the stuff that we can't figure out. We go to God for everything that we can't do. And Jeremiah did just that. He began with what he can't do. Lord, I can't keep doing this for you with all of this abuse. But he didn't walk away. He gave it to God. That's why the second thing we need to pray is faith. We take our helplessness to God because we trust and expect that God will and can do something about it. Hallisby continues explaining, quote, Prayer, therefore, consists simply in telling God day by day in what ways we feel that we're helpless. We are moved to pray every time the Spirit of God, which is the Spirit of prayer, emphasizes anew to us our helplessness. And we realize how powerless we are by nature to believe, to love, to hope, to serve, to sacrifice, to suffer, to read the Bible, to pray, and to struggle against our sinful desires. We open up and let God in, which is the only way God can really help. End quote. See, when the doctor asks you how you are, we don't say, I'm fine when something really hurts. That's stupid. 
When we sit in silence with God, don't say, I'm fine if something really hurts. Don't say, I'm fine when we're really very angry. Don't say, I'm fine when I'm really feeling lost. Let God in to the hurt. Let God in to the anger. Let God be lost with us, and maybe he'll guide us back out. Over the last couple of years, we had offered a course called the Prayer Course on Tuesday evenings. And together as a group, we learned to pray. And the first shocking lesson that we learned in that group was that prayer is not about mastering secret techniques. It's spending time alone with God and becoming completely open and honest about what's going on. That means there are no special words that you have to use. You don't have to use the these and the thous to sound more holy. There's no special pattern or purpose that you have to use. There's no special posture that you have to adopt. Sit if you want, stand, kneel, lay face down. If you want to, it doesn't matter. Close your eyes, open your eyes, fold your hands, reach towards the sky, pray silently, write it down like a letter, or speak out loud whatever comes to mind. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we spend some time alone with God and be completely open and honest about what's going on within us and around us. That's it. We can do that. We can all do that. Anybody can do that. In the prayer course videos, the leader, Peter Grieg, teaches us that there are three things to remember about our prayer. And they are, keep it simple, keep it real, and keep it up. Keep spending that time with God. Keep opening up. Keep trusting God with everything going on in us and around us. It doesn't matter if it's not pretty. It just has to be honest. That's what changes things. Now, talking to God is only half the story. Listening to what God has to say in reply is just as important. And we're going to pick up with that in the next couple of weeks. I bless you on this Lenten journey that we have begun. And God bless you as you draw closer to the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, since we spent time talking about the honesty and the openness of prayer, um, I'm going to help you pray, but I'm not going to do all the praying for you today. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to offer some, some phrases, some thoughts, some categories, some ideas, and then I want you to just silently give to God whatever comes into your mind. Uh, I might say something that ticks you off because there's something about that that's just rubbing your last nerve. Tell God about it. I might mention something that uh, you're actually feeling some fear about. That's okay. Tell God what you're afraid of. Tell God what's holding you up. I might share something that brings a smile to your face in joy and gratitude. That's great. God wants to be a part of the party and celebrate right along with you. So we will, uh, I'll open us with a time of prayer, and then I'll invite you to pray as honestly as you can with whatever comes into your mind silently, and then we will finish this time of prayer together by reciting our Lord's Prayer. Are you ready? All right, get comfortable, close your eyes, and let us pray. Gracious and loving God, it does not matter whether we've just had the best week of our lives or the worst, because all can still come and pray. It doesn't matter, Lord, if we feel like we are on top of the world right now or if we feel like the world is grinding us underfoot. We can come to you in prayer. Every single one of us, whether we know what to say or how to say it, we can come to prayer. Because as we've learned from you, Lord, by way of the prophet Jeremiah, prayer is simply being honest. Letting you be a part of the fear. Letting you be a part of the joy. Letting you be a part of whatever is going on. Lord, we all have that best friend in life that when we're thrilled, we can't wait to tell them the good news. Or when we're upset, we'll cry on their shoulder. Help us in the coming week to develop that best friend relationship with you. That whatever happens in our life, that we can't wait to share the good news and celebrate with you. And that no matter what happens, we can cry on your shoulder. So in this time of silence, Lord, hear us as we honestly pray. As the people of God, we pray for that one or two things that really brought a smile to our face this week.
Lord God, together in this time of silence, we want to pray to you about the biggest opportunity that we're looking forward to this week. Lord, in this time of silence, we want to each pray to you for that thing that's making us angry. Lord, in this time of silence, we want to pray to you in our own way about what is stressing us out the most. What is bringing this cold sweat fear into our lives? What are we afraid of? Lord, in this time of silence, we want to pray to you about our sins. The stuff that we have said and done and thought that we know darn well is wrong. We were probably mad or upset or feeling self-pity when we did it, and so we felt justified. But we know that regardless of why, it is still a sin in your eyes, and we need to confess it. We're going to be honest with you, Lord, now about the things that we know we've done wrong. And finally, Lord, in this time of silence, we want to share with you that thing that we are most looking forward to right now. Lord, thank you for letting us be honest. Thank you for loving us when we are willing to share what's really going on. Seeking your guidance and your blessing and your grace, we pray the prayer that Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And amen. I want to thank all of you who are worshiping here today. And I want to thank you for the gifts that you continue to send to God by way of First United Methodist Church. Whether we are together or whether we are apart, uh, it still takes your generous gifts uh, to keep the church up and running. And we're glad to say that this weekend we have reopened our in-person worship in a limited, modified uh, schedule. Uh, our uh, 8 o'clock and 9.30, we, the sanctuary will be open at the Frederick Street campus today. And uh, those of you that uh, want to join in worship again, feel free to come on out. And um, those of you that still aren't quite ready, that's fine. You continue to worship from home because we are still going to have this uh, online remote worship happening 
indefinitely into the future. But we also want to thank you for being willing to give remotely as well, whether you send a check made out to First United Methodist Church of Hanover through the mail to our church office, which is 200 Frederick Street, Hanover, Pennsylvania, 17331, or you can give electronically either by our church website using click on the giving tab and look for Easy Tithe. That allows you to give a gift on, on a either a personal credit card or a debit card, and um, you can do that as at once, or you can set it up as a recurring payment. You can also do electronic fund transfer where your bank talks to the church's bank. You're going to want to call the church office, and you need to fill out some paperwork, but our financial secretary, Holly Filippo, will be happy to walk you through it. Thank you also for your generosity to our pastor's discretionary fund, which continues to help people in some amazing ways. In the coming weeks, I'm going to tell you some more stories about some of the amazing things that you've been able to do, uh, families that have been touched, futures that have been changed because of your generosity. Thank you, and God bless. concludes our worship service for today, the second Sunday in Lent. 
But the praying that we began today is going to continue. And I want to encourage you, just as this past week, you've been trying to find some quiet time and some silence. This week, I want you to, to add to that silent time some times of prayer. And remember, it doesn't have to be flowery. It doesn't have to be structured. There's no magic formula. Just tell God what you're thinking. Be completely honest about what's going on inside of you and around you. Because God just wants to be a part of it. I look forward to seeing you at our next worship a week from today. And until that time, walk well with Christ. Be holy and be his ambassador. I bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit as we go now in his peace. Have a great week, everybody. Amen.